I'm Will Davis, Inspector of Monitors for CADU, that's Welsh Government's Historic Environment Service. I'm here today to talk about this castle and its buildings and how they develop from an earthwork at some point in the late 11th or 12th centuries to one of the most complicated sequences of buildings that we have in Wales and the marches. I suppose the main theme of my talk is uh, the nature of evidence and how we work out how old these buildings were, who built them, when and why, what their motives were and the problems that there were gaps in that evidence, whether you've got original documents, the standing buildings or archaeology, how they never really merge together and how it's always possible to reinterpret these sites in the light of new evidence. I think I'll start by telling you what I'm not going to talk about today. This is one of the most complicated castle buildings in Wales and the Borders. Um, it develops over several hundred years. There's a lot of documentary evidence for it, a lot of architectural, archaeological evidence. Um, and we can't get through them in half an hour, sort of 35 minutes. So um, I think I'll start off by just setting some boundaries. Uh, here it is, Castle Up on a Hill. We're again in this barn here, in a ward, out the ward, overlooking the planted medieval town. And you can see the streets, market squares, uh, grid plan overlying the initial Roman fort from the, the first Roman conquest of Wales. Um, We'll put them to one side, uh, we'll look purely at the castle and its structures um, because simply we haven't got enough time. I'm trying to skip over most of the history which will be kept taken care of by Kirsten and Connor, um, far more ably than I will, they'll remember dates, they'll know dates so they'll be correct, uh, but we will focus purely on the buildings, the architecture of this castle and how we arrive at what the Mortimers effectively would have seen or some of it anyway. Um, so, uh, thankless task today, really. Uh, we've asked to produce an original talk on a castle that's been pretty much done to death by somebody else over a number of years. It's the great Jeremy Knight. It's on my predecessor's predecessor, Inspector of Ancient Monuments Wales, for most of the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, wrote extensively on Usk. Um, sort of most of the <coughs> construction sequence of the castle down to a series of papers by Jeremy, uh, initially, I think, in 1977 in a monograph where you know, worked out the actual sequence that the thing was put up in, and then um, the, see the, mon uh, the actual book on us castle and the town buildings, the Logiston book from about I think like 10 years old now, isn't it? Something like that. Um, so really, what I thought I'd talk about today, as well as just the structures, what, what can I add to that, rather than just regurgitating somebody else's sequences, it was like how we look at castles, how we look at medieval buildings, and how we understand their development, how we manage to date them and pin specific builders and specific periods to them. Um, so just as an aid memoir, really, I'm going to, I'm going to just work out to use the um, animation function on PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> We've got several, several ways of doing this. Now, firstly, primary documentation, which uh, my colleagues will be doing a lot more on uh, in a minute. Uh, Usk is not a royal castle, was not a royal castle. Um, so you don't have the wealth of documentation that you do for, say, the Edward I campaigns in North Wales or yet anything that's in the pipe or crown rolls. Uh, you tend to find you start to hear of the castle being there when it's swept up in national events, so local regional wars, for example, plenty of them in South Wales and the borders, or when its lords die, it ends up in crowned hands briefly, and you get brief accounts of expenditure. But for some of its later owners, we do have reasonably, reasonably rich records for a baronial castle telling us of specific phases of building. <laughs> As is usually the case with these, we can't pin them to exact structures a lot of the time um, because they're quite vague. A chamber, where's that? We've got plenty of room spread around the inside of the building. So there's that temptation to fit sparse and incomplete historical evidence to often sparse and incomplete architectural, archaeological evidence. We have to be very careful to reading dates have a bit. We never get the Lord built the garrison tower at the height of three storeys and put a roof on it. Not for us, but there are other structures that I think we can pin down a bit more accurately. Um, antiquarians then, so we've got the building itself, what did it look like, what can't we see now, which is vital. Um, at Usk, we get a bit of help from the likes of Gastineau, the Buck Brothers, various printers, early cartography. Again, not great for this castle, but we do pick up some more information from that. Antiquarian excavations, in this case relatively late ones, in 1920s, 30, or 1930s onwards by the Humphreys family, where we can actually see some of the, the buildings have been exposed around the perimeter of the inner ward. Um, otherwise, I think we'd be guessing even more than we are now, where some of these things were. And architectural details, which is the key for any castle nerd to be able to sort of tell you just how old we think the structure is. This is a bit of clean castle, the only surviving tower. Um, and you can see it's quite distinctive, long, thin, arrow-looked little square oil at the bottom. 
imported stone, um, Dundee stone potentially, or Sutton from the Vale of Morgan, a couple of jams further up. And we know, or we're pretty sure, that is a Marshall work of 1218. Not because we have a document, but because Marshall had a motive on regaining Killian from the Welsh at that time, and because it looks just like other loops of a very similar type that we have in us castle on the garrison tower, which we'll skip over later on, which themselves aren't documented. But when you start to build the circumstances up in court, I think you'd have a case that this was martial work. And this is how most of the structures that us can clean and most of the other baronial castles get dated. It's, it's on its own, saying that looks like a structure, uh, that looks like a, a window at us wouldn't be enough, but we have other sources of evidence and that's how we put, the, that we put castles together and build up sequences. And finally, to start any piece of work on a decent on a castle, a big castle to understand it, you need a decent plan. You need accurate surveys. This is a, a, a sketch one, effectively, from uh, Napier, the architects who looked at a conservation management plan here some time ago. But when Jeremy started in the 70s to sort of put us castle together, pick it apart, and decide what came first, what came second, he would have started with a ground plan, and as I did before I joined Cadu, a pencil, biros scribbled it on right that comes before that that comes before that this is the plan you do you do the same with elevations and you work out the sequence of construction you tie all these together and you have a sequence that tells you roughly what happened at us castle um i think the theme today is really not just blindly questioning everything that's gone before and everything that's been written before but as we move around the buildings there are some established facts and some knowns um, but also querying some of these and asking, well, maybe we could tweak these a little bit either way in the sequence if you read the evidence slightly differently. And that's the beauty of any sort of research, isn't it? And that's, you know, you've, you've never had the last word. Somebody else will all, always come along after you and uh, correct you or just, just adjust your findings a little bit. So here we have it, uh, the bare bones. We're here in a big post medieval barn in the outer of two wards, two masonry enclosures, inner and outer, which form extended all the way around here on top of an earlier earthwork castle. We have a series of towers, round and square. It's a keep, circular towers, missing ones at corners, and a variety of internal buildings, some of which we know quite a bit about, others we know almost nothing about, other than that they're next to other structures, and you, you could attribute functions to some of these if you wanted to start guessing. And there it is. Um, in all its glory during some conservation works here at the Dovecot Tower which is um, a very enjoyable project uh, 18 months ago uh, with the Humphreys to re-roof and render that building so there it is you get the impression of you know height and dominance it's a oval enclosure sitting high on top of a localized hill local hillock overlooking the Esk Valley at its high point you've got this Norman keep and this variety of curtain walls ranged around two baileys now there's enough I think even from this photograph you could probably see there's enough difference in shape and style and height that these didn't all go up at the same time. So the job is to work out what happened when. I think the best way to do it is chronologically. So, um, historical records, um, as I say, you don't get direct references to any, any castle going up unless you're very, very lucky. So what you do is you work out who owns the lordship, who owns the area, who's, who's administering the territory, and then you can sort of fit them to the castles. And they often have a motive or an opportunity, whether it's regaining a piece of land, whether it's a particular threat, whether it's the Welsh or other marcher lords. And for most of the 12th century, uh, the Clare family are holding us. Um, we get the first reference to us in 1136, when it's seized by the Welsh of Caerleon. My historian colleagues will probably um, contradict me now and tell me the date's wrong by a couple of years, but pretty much, anyway, early 12th century, uh, a castle at Usk is seized by the Welsh, implying that it's been there for some time. Now, I'll leave Kirsten to run through the smacks of whether there's possibly something on the site beforehand. I think there almost certainly was. It's an earthwork castle. Um, but other than that, we know nothing else about what's standing here. And then throughout the 12th century, I won't even read through these, you can look at them for yourselves. Um, any match a castle, you have sequences of events where people take hold of them, they're attacked, they pass through families, and you can pin the structures that you see to any one of these in a line. Um, so we've got the first castle, if we're assuming there's something given the 11th, 12th century, the antiquarians give us the first piece of evidence. We see the earthwork layout before later alterations of an inner enclosure, probably a ringwork castle, so defended palisaded enclosure, a larger outer one encompassing it, and then almost a hornwork or a third enclosure further on. Now this has been cut about a bit in the 19th century, 
they're the earliest 20th centuries, but I think this gives us the bare bones of the castle before the masonry appears. So this is probably what we can see of anything that Richard Strongwell declares and the Welsh are seizing in that first half of the 12th century. And probably say the same for Howell of Cleon, whatever he captured, he's installed in the castle by Henry II. Um, you know, he'd have been familiar with this, the shape of the castle anyway. Um, at some point in this period, we have a few motives, means for somebody to start building the castle in stone, the Norman keep we're about to see in a minute. Whether it's Henry II, installs a sort of a, a sort of a regional um how do you say it? he's almost a henchman in south east wales in morgan for, for hell for about 10 years but it's henry's actually done this himself the crown 1180s you actually have crown expenditure on the castle of usk 10 quid could you build a tower that big is the question quite possibly um and then finally at end of the 12th century we have a key date which is isabella declared declare this marries the great william marshall so we'll start with a plan um the earthworks, as you can see, they, they're not quite what they were when Cox saw them. You've got the inner enclosure, you've got this in black, a very, very irregular Norman keep at one corner, which is the first structure we know about. And we can assume that they stood with a sort of wooden palisade defending the rest of the Ancien, the rest of the defensive line. Here it is. Uh, very few of these survive in the southern Welsh borders. We've got a pile of them in Glamorgan, quite a few in West Wales. Monmouth, I think we have about three. We've got us, um, got White Castle, and uh, there's a huge, huge royal structure at Chepstow and Monmouth, which are a completely different kettle of fish. But this is, is one of very few in, in, the, in the southeast to survive. Um, in itself, it's, it's much more interesting than just a sort of straight rectangle. This is a Royal Commission plan. And you can see various phases of patching, additions. You've got the 14th century latrine turrets added to make it more comfortable. But I think the key thing, the most interesting element, it's only discovered about what, 15, 20 years ago was that when some Virginia, I think it was Virginia Creeper came off the front, this turned out to have actually started life as a gatehouse. So can't quite see it here, but we can point it out to go around. So just the right, left of this, right of this bird, for us, it's your left, isn't it? A few springers of a big arch. So at the start, this is a gatehouse that's converted to a tower at some later date. Can't really see any Norman details here. You've got probably Herbert windows inserted higher up, but there are various blockings and openings from later alterations by subsequent owners. There is Norman detail visible. Uh, so you'll see this as you step straight outside. A couple of lovely 12th century windows, um, quite curiously set back from the front of the opening um, from some sort of imported stone. I thought it was Sudbrook Triassic, but I think somebody, I think I've read somewhere that box in Wiltshire's a more likely origin, if not somewhere further afield again. You could put that on the back of a cart, I suppose, and it, it sort of carry it over quite simply. But you get a good impression of one elevation of the initial keep, this massive splayed base. You just drop back a bit you can see the thing just plunging down the edge of the rock to lower ground and it's very high above the level we're standing at the outer ward now which is about two meters above the medieval level too so it's a real a real hike up into this building um parallels locally i mean goodrich 1170s 1180s well it's far uh, it's a far neater far more um far more architectural flamboyant tower it's got your classic uh, norman pilaster buttresses Quite a lot of decorative work in it um so not a direct parallel but it's it's the sort of type and scale of tower that you tend to see in these castles of the second <coughs> second sort of rank of the of the um of the marcher lords probably closer to usk again with a few and few to survive anywhere in mid wales is hay so nestled on the side of a tudor mansion another three-story tower <coughs> with windows at two levels this one's been knocked out in the, in the <coughs> Post medieval period, but again, you've got one round out's head there, one there, um, which again, slides aren't great for this, but you can just take my word for it. At the level my point is at there, you've got an initial gate passage which has been blocked and completely backfilled, and it's converted to a tower at some later date, and then a gatehouse added next to it. And then grander again, more the theme, we've got, we've got Ludlow, and I think probably the most blatantly blocked gate that you'll ever see if you're doing building archaeology. Where again a much grander Norman gatehouse has been blocked up, converted into a residential keep with a sort of 13th century, 13th century gatehouse added next to it. It's a very, very common sequence. A um, lot of Norman castles in Wales and the Marches have that very simple initial set of defences, a tower either acting as a gate or alongside a very simple opening. You don't start seeing twin towered gatehouses, more elaborate things until a bit later on. Um, so by the end of the 12th century, somebody's established a castle up here. I, 
I kind of put my money on it being a royal royal expenditure after quite a lot of trouble. The lordships to and fro in between various factions of Welsh and Marsh and Crown. Um, but what we do know is certainly by sort of middle of the 12th century, there's a borough established over the top of the Roman fortress at the base of the hill, so castle up here. You see the grid street plan, bits of it anyway. Um, much depopulated, presumably after Glyndura Rebellion, where our records, allegedly records, of most of the population in the area being wiped out and us being pretty much on its knees as a settlement. But you can see the lake, you see the town defences further around, running around. Pretty much the extent of modernness, really. It didn't, didn't go that much further. And also at the same time, within that, you've got a Benedictine house of nuns established probably by the Clares again. So the Normans do what they do everywhere else the castle, the ecclesiastical establishment, and the economic one next to them. Um, so William Marshall uh, needs no introduction, really, and was powerful medieval magnates. Uh, takes the lordship through his marriage to Isabella de Clare. And Building start appearing at us castle. We don't have any direct records of this. He's a busy man. He's all over Europe. He spends a lot of time in Ireland. But we have towers that typologically we can date to the first half of the 13th century. And Jeremy's, I think, big um, big reveal, I suppose, his original piece of work was that what's Marshall, when, when's Marshall likely to have done this? If you've got structures that look like part of the early 13th century, when could he have done it? It's obviously when he gets back from Ireland after a long period in France, basically fighting wars for different kings. In this case, John restores in a lot of his South Wales lands. And he takes us on, he starts building. Um, again, no direct references to this, but it couldn't really have been anybody else. The towers that we see here, big round towers, that are added to a curtain wall on angles. Stylistically, they can't be earlier. There's no way they could be anywhere into the sort of middle of the 12th century. They're certainly not much later. They don't have much in terms of what well, survival doesn't have much in terms of facilities, as you say. Um, so they're somewhere in that early 13th century period, and really the, the motive is, is Marshall, the greatest magnet in the realm, building himself a castle that looks just like, or very, very similar to other works we can pin on him at Chepstow, Middle Bailey Walls, Lower Bailey Gatehouse, and the surviving bits of Killian. So we have a sort of faceted curtain wall, again, a very common late Norman, early 13th century method of enclosing an earlier earthwork, sort of seams of straight stretches, capped at the angles by big round towers, one surviving brilliantly, one in a fragmentary state. I think Henry Humphreys has told me it seemed possibly a stump of the other one, which was later flattened and had a solar block put over the top of it in the 14th century, and another rebuilt by Gilbert de Clare. So this is a period where your other match laws, like Hubert de Burr, are starting to build geometrically regular castles, like Skenfrith, north northeastern Monmouthshire, square, square enclosures, systematic capping of angles with, with with towers that flank and flank and fire along the walls. You see the same with Grosmont, White Castle, Caldicott with the Bowens. It's, it's a sort of emerging trend in castle building throughout Europe and has transformed. And presumably, we still have a palisaded outer ward of some sort and most of the rest of the buildings in wood. We'll look at the individual structures in a minute now. Uh, the key surviving thing is the Garrison Tower, uh, which is magnificent. It's as fine a tower as you'll see in any, any Welsh castle. Um, you can all see the, the outlines all quite clear, isn't it? But there it is. So the world's sort of facing the keep as you come into the inner ward. Uh, the top chunk of it is a bit later. It's the late 13th century addition. You can almost see the break in the masonry halfway up. What we have is effectively a three-story tower um, hanging over the edge of the slope, facing across the River Usk. So you can imagine this in a line of three. It really is a statement to the, the Welsh who are still holding or still contesting the territory on the western side of the river. You know, don't really need massive towers on the strongest part of the castle, but hey, we're going to build them anyway. You can see us doing it. Um, and quite a simple building, really. It's got an integrated stair, which again, uh, at two levels, taking you up to the higher, higher uh, taking you up to the roof. Um, quite fancy work of about the wall walk that the curtain wall comes through the back of the tower, so you don't actually enter into the room. There's a very short passageway leading to what's a later latrine, box latrine, hanging over the edge. But in general, it's quite a simple building. It's been posited as a replacement for the keep. But I think you have to overlook that because there are two other towers potentially of a similar size doing pretty much the same thing. And the keep is still in use. It's got probably more comfortable accommodation in terms of the size of the rooms. Um, I think it's a bit of a misnomer. It's got technological um, details comparable to keeps. It's big, it's got very thick walls, but it's, it's not quite the same. It's just an enormous, enormous corner tower, but without any particularly fancy accommodation. Um, so we can see here a uh, original doorway at uh, that level there. Um, then you can see a passageway running through the back, little window loop looking back out at the yard. And bits of there's a cross loop here at the power put level, got the ones at Killian, 
small box at the bottom, square oiler to the base of it there. And most of the rest, this is windows or later, later Claire work, it would seem. Um, and then two external views. That was as far as I was willing to walk on the day. It was a bit wet and I didn't want the dye falling down the slope. <laughs> so you can see just that the height and bulk of it, see of offset stages, string courses. Again, these square based on, sorry, I've got a bit better shot of these, but you can take my word for it. You saw a picture of one at the start and they're almost identical. And there it is um, from, from both sides. And the first one, you can just see the base of its corresponding southwestern corner tower. Sort of looking across it, it's, it's companion. Um, and these are effectively the towers of the richest magnet in the realm, the most powerful magnet in the realm. He doesn't do things by halves. He can afford to build at that scale. Whereas other matches, local matches, if you look at the Castle Clan via this guy down the road, you have things that are similar, but far more modest in scale and ambition. Um, and the inner gatehouse is where we come to one of these crossroads and have we got the interpretation right? Here it is. At some point in the 13th century, we presume, the gate at the bottom of the keep is blocked up. We've got the same problem at Hay. When did this happen? And we still haven't decided up there. Uh, and the assumption's always been that when Marshall built the curtain walls and the towers, a new, very modest little entrance was added next door to it. Which is the fact that you're holding the curtain wall. It's got a pointed head. You've got the remains of a pot colour slot at the front. So presumably, if you look at the fact we've got a scar at this level and nothing up here, there's some sort of forward timber work, perhaps, rather than a, you know, a projecting tower. Most of the gates must have been internal, but there must be something to operate the pot colours from. And it's been assumed, animation again, here it is, <laughs> typologically, that this is martial work as well. It ties up quite neatly in terms of the shape of the arch with the middle bailey gate and the fact upper bailey gates at Chepstow Castle, which are known martial work from the end of the, end of the 12th, beginning of the 13th centuries. And here we have hay again. Um, you immediately see this, oh, that's got to be 1200, just from it's a sort of that transitional period between Romanesque square square columns but with the pointed head and in the case of hay they've added a portcullis to the front of that in the middle of the 13th century so the assumption's always been that jeremy um, was of, of the opinion that well you know these must be all of a date I've, i think i've said myself possibly in a student seminar in york about 30 years ago 20 years ago i can't remember how old i am that you know i'd, 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 I'd parroted out the fact that yes it's clearly clearly a sort of early 13th century gatehouse um but then you get the benefit which jeremy didn't have of seeing the rest of it things get cleared away they're more visible and in this particular case, uh, you look at the, the entrance, and in all castles, the devil's in the detail in terms of how old are these. Typology is a bendable thing. Um, you, you see people really having to read their words, and they've assumed something is 50, 60 years older or younger than it is. In this particular case, though, you can set parameters. So if you've got a bar stop on the outer arch here, just above the doggy sign, and behind it, you can see the remains of the pot colour groove, which are half round, or would have been half rounded. So instead of coming down a square slot, You've got specific carved pieces. Now, a piece of work by Neil Guy of the Castle Studies Group, a quite phenomenal piece of work. I mean, I wouldn't have had the patience to do it. He measured just about every port colour slot he could find and looked at them, photographed them in the British Isles and then further afield, and came to the conclusion that you only, start, you only really have half round port colours grooves from about the middle of the 13th century onwards, 1250s, 1260s. And most of them start off at King's Works Royal Castles with the marchers copying later on. That's the case, and the form of this as well, which looks like something from the late 13th century. There is no way that at least the outer order of this gatehouse and the portcullis, which seems to be integrated with the rest of the structure, could be martial work. It's been done late, slightly later on. Um, begging the question, the keep's probably still in use as a gate by then. So it's the kind of thing where, it, I'll say this, somebody will contradict me in another 10 years' time, but that's the way we piece castles together. It's those, it's those fine details to the, the big picture stuff, the shape of something, or just what that window looks like. Um, the question being, you know, who did who did rebuild the gate? It's, it's got to be something that's going on. It's a mid, mid to late 13th century design, um, which will made a Clare structure. Um, now the Clares, uh, again, they sort of take on the mantle from the marshals and various other. They, they, they're the leading magnates of the day. Um, they were disgustingly wealthy. Um, Gilbert II himself is probably most famous as the, the builder of Caerphilly. Massive castles at Morlice above Merthyr Tydfil, adding to or starting afresh probably another sort of 15, 20 odd castles just in the South Wales realms alone. And then obviously hugely landed in Suffolk, basically Clare itself, uh, Tunbridge Castle, Tunbridge Wells, very, very prolific castle builder, as was his, his father Richard. Um, we can dismiss as doing any work at Clare, um, at us, because again, the buildings don't quite look right. So for Gilbert, we actually have some documentary evidence, uh, 1263 to 95, um, dates are burned in my mind because we've done a lot of work on Clare castles elsewhere in South Wales. 
Gilbert's holding the lordship and he's building everywhere else in the area. A um, piece of work by Rick Turner and Stephen Priestley about 10 years ago really looked into the Clare accounts. Again, they can't pin down specific structures, but you can be pretty certain that their you know, building campaigns can refer to specific buildings in some cases. Uh, in this particular case, the treasure tower is mentioned and a, a, a corner tower that they're, they're adding to. It's been re-roofed, it's been heightened. Um, now this has been hacked about a lot in later years. We've got lots of doorways that don't particularly, windows don't particularly look very convincing, but a cross arrow loop with short cross arms, which again are of a type from the dated structures, the documented structures, we start to see towards the end of the 13th century, sort of the middle, middle decades onwards. Very distinctive Clare work that um, most of his South Wadian castles have something similar, whether Caerphilly, Lamblevian, if I identify some at Newport, which is another talk in itself, which almost certainly Clare work. So even in a battered elevation like this, if you've got the evidence, this is the tower they're talking about. It's lost the story, um, quite a substantial thing. It's been built, it's been, been completely rebuilt from the ground up, presumably on the site of an earlier town. You can see another lovely short arm cross loop there, and the remains of a latrine turret just in front of it on the curtain wall. Um, almost, almost certainly work of Gilbert II. What he also did with it was added on an upper floor. So you see a cross loop there again, we've lost that. But get a corbelled parapet, very like the one tacked onto the top of Garrison Tower later on, which again aren't necessarily contemporary. You see these at a lot of the Clare castles. The corbels themselves are impossible to date, a round court, quarter round corbels, the same as any other one, but the Clares do start building them en masse, sort of from the 12 years onwards, so they turn up at all of their sites. Um, so then we have records of alterations at Usk, the tower over the prison being either built or added to by Gilbert's son, Gilbert the Younger III, who dies at Bannockburn in 1314. Um, he spends quite a lot of his youth at Usk in his minority, and presumably this work is describing this top story with another corbel parapet here. You can see some later windows, either ordered by him or his father, and this. Sort of box latrine, which makes the, the accommodation slightly more comfortable than just some, some empty rooms and some arrow loops. So this could be the tower over the prison, but again, we've lost two other corner towers, at least, and one's been completely rebuilt. So again, it's, it's important to, to caveat all these statements. It's not necessarily the tower we think the documents are talking about. And again, uh, this is again this is, a, this is a lecture in itself. Turner and Priestley looked at this in some detail. Uh, the surviving Clare documents for the area, um, even though they're a huge family, a uh, major family, um, most of their monuments and records are destroyed during the Dispenser Wars in the first decade of the 14th century. So we don't even have an architect or accounts for Great Caerphilly. You know, it's, it's quite obscure in documentary terms, but we get fragments here and there. And at Usk, see, they, they sort of dip in and out of history. So we have records of work on a hall and chamber. 38 to 9, a new chamber. Now, could this be the surviving building that we know as the Great Hall now? Or is it one of the other buildings we've got remains of ranged around the curtain walls? Then there's a chapel, which you can just see behind the hedge here, just a, one wall of that survives really, um, back and onto a curtain wall. And uh, the hall itself. Now, we don't get full sets of building accounts here about roofers being brought in from different bits of the area. We hear about specific craftsmen doing specific jobs, but there's enough activity in that opening decade of the 14th century for them to be able to suggest well it's got to be this stylistically the few details we have architecturally there really aren't many a few chamfered door jams in here um, that's a 15th century fireplace further up that's been renewed um, you can just about merge the two together that's the great hall it's an interesting question of was the hall always in this location if the principal tower is at this end of the castle was there something else freestanding or sitting down next to the sort of the, the main sort of retreat or solar block in, in the original norman keep and quite possible that these moved around. There may have been more than one. And worth remembering too that even though it seems like quite a big thing to do for some of these sort of semi-absent lords to be building massive new structures at their castles, the Clares are doing this five miles down the road at the same time. I think it's the biggest single enclosure castle in England and Wales at Plan Gibby. Um, it's, it's stunning. I mean, it's up there with us in terms of excitement to visit. It's not, not actually open to the public. But um, at some point, in the middle of the 13th century, it's probably Gilbert the Younger, but there's earlier work in the gatehouse, builds this monster on top of a ridge. It's just on the other side of the Usk, um, in a small earlier lordship, Tregreig. Um, and that's probably the biggest twin tower gatehouse built in the British Isles, or attempted anyway. You've got um, similar size to Beaumaris, seem to have had three sets of portcullises. Um, 
again, completely in self de um, self-contained uh, defences. You can actually shut this off from the rest of the castle. Have covered wall walk leading to another tower up here. Seems to be in a principal accommodation. Again, no parallels in terms of its form. Big apsidal or rounded corner projection between blocks. Stair turrets, and again, its own set support colourses. So you've got this massive contained household, another twin tower gatehouse, lots of other towers. And if you go on, you can see some of this on Time Team. There's a good episode where Rick Turner, my sort of late predecessor, uh, did some small excavations in them, time to see if there were any buildings inside the castle. It always seems to have been unfinished. Um, I'm not going to bang on about this for much longer, but it's to make the point that the Clares are building everywhere, they're building just down the road. Um, we know that Gilbert the Younger is dead by 1314, you know, assuming that most of this was put up by, there by him. And uh, then his, uh, his sister Elizabeth de Burgh takes on the lordship, may finish off certainly bits of the Lord's Terror that the, the great sort of keep. But um, the point being that Usk is not necessarily the centre of the Clare's activities in the area. There's two, a couple of ideas of why they're doing this so close to an existing established lordship. And the first one is that. Um, well, you know, they're just going to replace Usk. You see this after the Welsh Wars. A lot of the, the, the major barons, they start building themselves castles in quite detached locations away from earlier settlements on the edges of towns like Harden and Flincher. So it's the whole, you know, they're sitting sort of slightly at arm's length from the population they have to deal with. And maybe that's what they're trying to do here. You've got a new, more comfortable country seat. Or, or as they concluded with the previous set of investigations, is this some sort of Belvedere or sort of a, almost like summer residence, uh, a, a sort of a ridiculous sort of hunting lodge come, sits in the middle of a park some sort of pleasure palace effectively which I just find a little bit even if you're even if you're rich enough to, to do this it seems a bit of overkill for something you're just going to go hunting at every now and again there's nothing like this on this scale or anywhere else in terms of hunting lodges it, it's a ridiculous structure so I think you could, you could look at this either way um, but certainly they're they're building in parallel that's going to be even grander scale um, so yeah, uh, I think I've mixed the slide up. This is just back to the chamber block again. Uh, we'll go out there later on. Architectural evidence, I'll run through this quite quickly, but this is the butt graving showing the hall, which is in there, which has been reduced to this gable. You can see a solar block at the high end. The main accommodation was in here. That's gone, apart from the loos and some of the base of the wall on the other side. And then you've got this surviving chamber block, which is quite fragmentary here, isn't the scaffold. On the other side, you've got this suite of high end buildings with a chapel at one side and presumably some decent accommodation in the tower that Gilbert remodels here so the focus of where they're living is possibly being pushed back across the castle by them and it keeps sitting and you can speculate on what they're using it for um so move on to Elizabeth de Burgh Gilbert dies and uh, his sister inherits the estates and manages to lose a succession of husbands very very quickly it's like three in ten years or something like that I think and um it's effectively a, a Quite, quite a formidable character. There's certainly building at her castles as well. And Usk is a preferred residence. She's got a, she styles herself, I think, Lady of Clare, Widow of Clare in Suffolk. Maybe this incredible account, I think, of the entire baggage train trekking across the country on almost royal scale to spend time in her estates in South Wales. And she's certainly building at Usk. They're preparing for her in a document of 1319. And then you've got, um, again, various structures are mentioned. We've got expenditure for buildings as a dresser house. So presumably this is some sort of food preparation area, or um, what would you call it in a restaurant? Or says um, sort of privy kitchen, or most you know, just preparing the, the final elements on food garnishing and so on before bringing things into the main residential area. So presumably it's somewhere in this area here. That's the high end of the hall. In there, we don't know. Um, you've got a new gate towards the town, which is presumably the outer wall gatehouse, which is under the current residence. You can see this sort of straight vertical joint on the commission plan. Uh, most of the structure behind it is now underground, a couple of metres down, but I get it here now. Um, a ladies' chamber and stable. So again, speculation, Turner and Priestley suggest it's this. They're renovating the chamber block, a bit of a building next to it. It's meant for an oriel window, but again, it could just as well be any of these other structures ranged around. Um, new chambers and chimneys, take mm. your guess, lots of internal buildings. And, uh, you know, latrines, is that that? potentially make the keep more comfortable certainly 14th century work up there and a bell tower which presumably is a wooden structure on top of the chapel in here um and it's just an illustration of the keep uh, you know we've got several not there's a norman windows on the side there you can see all manner of different breaks i think you've got a wooden probably pen it's like structure coming up the side there's a bit of a break in the masonry you've got later doorways inserted at different levels leading out onto other buildings so by the time you get to the mid 14th century it's a Norman keep that the levels have been altered in. It's got windows and doors and stairs now. It's got, it's got a latrine block and it's more comfortable. So again, somebody could be 
somebody could be living in there in a lot more comfort than they would have done in the 12th century and certainly some of this will have been standing some of this will have been done by the time elizabeth the bird dies it's just to give you a quick illustration of just how much the keep's been knocked about so you've got norman windows here at this level you've got various doors 13th century ones which are quite quite easy to spot but then a range of late medieval openings that are blocked at different levels of the structure implying that you everything's changed around in there what you can't see and jeremy didn't have the benefit of in the 1970s was the, the original norman gate arch down here which was covered in virginia creeper but that's what we have so again, to give this impression these castles constantly changing as the accommodations upgraded people have their own personal preferences and tastes or simply isn't comfortable enough and they're altered to bring them up the spec bit by bit at the same time if we're looking at a gatehouse towards the town being built i think we can assume that um elizabeth or possibly when the clares have started the outer ward walls uh, these are all in woodland in the earthworks but you can see various bits of stony lumps and bumps sticking up here we're standing that's your curtain wall to the left of you probably not at this level but certainly lower down it's thicker than the other wall of the barn probably because it's bolstering back against the slope but there's certainly some medieval fabric sort of under our feet to, our, to my left to your right and then we have the rectangular gatehouse I would guess if we look at an inner gate built by the Clares when they blocked the keep up it's very very small it's very very weak there's a record of some wooden defense being put in front of it by one of the Gilberts but uh, my guess would be you supplement that by putting something more impressive on your outer defenses and sorting the outer defenses out otherwise you've got a state-of-the-art castle with a hole in the wall for the entrance um, there it is outgate this um, it's been continuously inhabited uh, pretty much since it was built in the 14th century so in a half we can't see this is the addition um, you can see for yourselves any castle people when you go outside I, I, I could be persuaded either way and it's just how old the building we're looking at is um, general accepted knowledge it's a clare work internally so you've got this berry you know actually you know actually the archway here does look quite convinced it's got a pot color so at some point it's about 13 20 to 1 elizabeth de burke spanned in the thing or he's building onto a gatehouse here is that a complete rebuild is it a new structure you could argue that elizabeth builds this bit and then you've got late mortimer work tacked on the outside of it stylistically i think you could probably make an argument either way um <coughs> the corbels don't really tell you anything you see blocked up crenellations at this level and then this remains it's like a lot of castles it remains the only building that's still in use after the rest of it's gone to ruin um there we are um this is just a good idea of the, the way levels have changed since the 19th century where the inner arch of the original gatehouse is at the level you're standing at outside i'm not sure i'm looking at henry right at the back and have you actually seen it or have we just worked that out i can't, can't quite decide but seen it, seen it yeah. yeah real so it's there it's somewhere under your feet so somewhere this enormous amount enormous amount of materials built up and it shows you just what a plunge there would have been the original norman entrance in the keep um we're in a barn now it's, it's post medieval but we can assume and from again building accounts from various periods there were other similar substantial buildings of stables workshops and so on you look at the tide map you look at various estate maps there are rectangular structures down here in the bottom of the, the outer walls so to wrap up uh, the only other sort of surviving structure we can really look at is the funny little tower capping the angle i to go back have we got that on there yeah we have it's down there basically tiny little round corner tower um again the details they look 14th century i'm not even going to begin to speculate who built it it could have been de Beer, it could have been some mortimers but it's certainly there by the time the final mortimers <laughs> are no longer around looking over the town and you can see the benedictine house here st mary's and really just a sort of yeah just to finish off with this this is this is the, the task that's faced by the owners by the humphreys and that it's a fourth bridge project they're not a state body like cadu or stark england that they you know don't have bottomless resources to be just constantly spending armies and masons to be appointed but over the decades they've put a phenomenal amount of, of conservation work into the site an enormous amount of effort and care um to produce a sort of really wonderful sort of uh let's just say there's a feel of tranquil decay here that is actually a bit of a it's a bit, a bit misleading because it's not it's solid because they've been working around it year on year on year and this is the latest structure that we worked on where the crumbling lambadic limestone that most of the cast, um, castles built of was just falling to pieces almost like you just hit hit the jelly with a mallet you know you get a similar sort of effect crumbling off in lumps so we made the decision then to re-render the front of this little tower it's very very visible from the town now leaving out the, the actual details and also put a roof on it as well to keep the water out um other than that it's, it's, it's given us a good chance to have a closer look at it it's an odd little thing it's got three nice sets of windows inside perhaps some sort of a again you can imagine sitting there 
at leisure, looking out over the town, perhaps gardens down below on a terrace, but now it's safe for posterity. Um, so I haven't touched the mortimers really here, simply because I don't think anything you can see can be confidently ascribed to the mortimers. I think most of the, most of the buildings, purely on architectural grounds to me, look like they're of the earlier 14th century, with the possibility some of the outer ward down here might be added to or embellished. There are plenty of structures that may have been added to, repaired in the 14th century, but I don't actually think we can pin them down with confidence because none of the details really work. Um, and so here we have, this is pretty much the castle, I think this is Dylan Roberts, or somebody correct me if I'm wrong, from the Royal Commission, um, when they did the survey, a fantastic reconstruction drawing, giving you a sort of impression of what it would have looked like probably around the 1360s when it becomes a uh, sort of Mortimer Castle. And you can see these various, if, if, I think really I haven't done it just there'd be more buildings crammed inside it, some of which may have been um, very, very new at that time. And to end on a slide, you know, how, do we, how do we find out more? How, you know, what, what, what don't we know? Well, we're missing a lot of the structures that the documents are telling us about. You can't see them, they don't survive above ground, or they're surviving in a state like this, this, this range around the back of the keep, but it could be almost anything, effectively. So the next thing that's going to happen, and we hope we'd be able to unveil this today, but um, our, we've got some AWOL geophysical consultants at the moment. We can't seem to get the turn up on site. The plan is next to do some uh, ground penetrating radar and deep resistivity survey across the inner ward. Not necessarily to find that much because of related disturbances, but um, simply because it will help us to flesh out those arrangements of buildings inside it. And then as the conservation work around the castle continues, whether it's the elevations of the keep or the Dovecot Tower, we're gradually seeing more and more and more. We're spotting jams on gatehouses and so on. And we'll leave it there. Um, we've got to the point where the Mortimers take the lordship over. I'm not going to butcher the Humphreys family history by explaining what happened in the, 19th, the early 20th century. Um, or go on a ramble for later structures that you can no longer see. I think we stop at the point where it becomes a Mortimer Castle. Thank you.